During the week, I uh, had a man come to my door. Uh, he was a man of maybe uh, 50 to 60 years old. Uh, he was collecting for children with cancer. He was very passionate about his work, very involved in his work, and uh, he seemed really keen to chat, and so we spoke for a while. What do you do? He eventually asked me. I'm pastor, I responded. So we got on to the topic of religion. He believed that in the end, the good and his bad, uh, and the bad of his life would be weighed up, and if he'd done enough, uh, his next existence would be better. I said, oh, okay. Um, if that were true, I would be very worried, because I think I would be going down and not up. And he, he, at that point, his face changed. And he looked down. He became unsettled. And he said, well, yes, um, when I was a boss, I, I really used to yell at my employees. But he said, I had to. I, I had to. I just had to. Um, and then he went on to point out all of the ways in which it was really good for his employees that he should yell at them. Conscience. It's something that we all have to deal with. Uh, there is not a person in this room that would know nothing of an uneasy conscience. Uh, we might not always express it, as this man did, uh, but we do have to deal with it. I did invite him to church, but he didn't uh, come. This morning we are looking at Mark chapter 6 and verses 14 through to 29. And here we have a man who seems to have had a troubled conscience. His name was Herod. Herod was the ruler of Galilee. And Galilee was the region. Uh, Galilee was the region in the north of Israel where Jesus was at the time. And Herod was the ruler there under Rome. And Herod hears about a fellow who is working wonders in the region. Um, by the way, in secular history, uh, there is reference to the fact that Jesus worked wonders. And Herod hears about this and he gets uh, jumpy. And so we read in verse 14. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Herod, Herod hears about this fellow and he goes, oh, um, this must be John the Baptist come back from the dead. It seems like a strange thing to say. I mean, others in verse 15 are saying that this man is Elijah, a person who had been prophesied that he would come at some time, or it's some great... Prophet, but why does Herod go for the John the Baptist interpretation? Well, you get a view into his thinking there in verse 16, where it says there, When Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. He seems to have had John on his mind because he's conscious of the fact that he beheaded him. Uh, there seems to have been some conscience going on here. He's aware that he beheaded him unjustly. And so when he hears about this wonder work, he thinks it must be John the Baptist risen from the dead. That was one of the opinions that was going on about, about Jesus. And that's the one that he latches on to. He has an uneasy conscience. And what I want to say to you as we look at this passage is that I believe that what we have here is a fellow who didn't know how to handle his conscience. Uh, he was a guy who did all of the wrong things when it comes to dealing with his conscience. And so we're going to look at a few of his mistakes and also of his wife. And I want us to turn those mistakes around and I want us to think, well, how should we deal with an uneasy conscience? And so that is what we are doing this morning. Uh, by the way, next week and the week after that, while I'm away, um, Bill Tuddle is going to preach on the conscience, aren't you, Bill? Can't see where you are. Yes, you still are. Good, great. Okay, um, we arranged that separately. Uh, we weren't aware that we were both planning on speaking on this subject. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, what I'm doing this morning really will touch on the surface. I'm sure that 
Bill will do a much better job over the next two weeks fleshing this subject out. Um, so that's great. I don't think that'll be a problem at all. So how do we deal with an uneasy conscience? Let me just make four remarks here. Firstly, do not disregard your conscience. Do not disregard your conscience. This seems to have been the way that Herod and his wife Herodias handled their conscience. Um, uh, Herod and his wife just disregarded their conscience. You get that in the account which follows of how John uh, had been beheaded. Uh, John the Baptist, by the way, was a prophet who ran around saying that the Messiah, the Saviour, was coming. And verses 17 and following, we are told about how John met his end. John, we are told, in verse 18, had confronted Herod about his sin. In verse 18, we read that John said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod, you see, had taken his uh, brother and brother's wife, Herodias. Herodias had left Herod's brother and had then married Herod. Uh, it was almost incestuous. Um, this had been explicitly forbidden by the law of God in Leviticus, but that is what they went ahead and did anyway. And so John spoke up about this. Um, he said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And both Herod and his wife reacted. How did they react? Well, they reacted by disregarding their conscience but in two different ways. Firstly, Herodias, the wife, reacted in anger. In verse 19, we read, Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Herodias wanted to kill John. This is why later on in the story, uh, when Herodias' daughter is offered a favour by Herod, Herodias says to her daughter, Ask for the head of John the Baptist. Herodias was angry. <coughs> and this is the way that we sometimes respond when our conscience is pricked, especially if it's pricked by a particular person. Uh, rather than acknowledge that what it is that we've done is wrong, we, we flare up. Uh, rather than acknowledging that, yes, we have broken God's law, that we've lied or we've stolen or committed adultery or been greedy or malicious or self-centered or, or some other thing, rather than just acknowledging that, we get angry with the person who may have mentioned this to us. Anger is sometimes the mask of a guilty conscience. Sometimes when people receive um, a false accusation, they don't get nearly as angry as when they have somebody speak to them about something that actually has an element of truth about it. Um, anger is sometimes the mask of a guilty conscience. Whatever is said hits their nerve, the nerve of their conscience, and the reaction of that is anger. Uh, their anger is a, diver a diversion from having to actually face up to the facts. Um, you can imagine Herodias, who does this guy think he is. I'm like, um, wife of the king. He's got no right to tell me that. And so she just flares up. It's a way of dealing with it. Uh, we know we've done the wrong thing and we don't want to put it right. And so instead of getting on the defensive, we get on the aggressive. Uh, this is what Herodias did. She reacted in anger. Herod, on the other hand, evaded the issue. It seems in this passage, as we look at how Herod responded, that he was just really indecisive about the whole thing. On the one hand, for example, we are told in verse 7, at 17 that he does want to throw John into prison for the sake of his wife. Um, and so he does that. And yet on the other hand, we see that Herod himself had a certain respect for John. We read in verse 20, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Herod, we see there, had a certain respect 
for John. Uh, there was something about him. Perhaps it was his, his integrity. Perhaps it was the fact that he was actually willing to speak about things even if that was hard. But whatever it was, Herod could see that this man was a just man. And, and with regard to what, much of what John had to say, Herod was willing to listen to him and to respond to him gladly. And so in the end, Herod just locks John up in jail and leaves him there. On the one hand, he doesn't want to kill him as Herodias wanted, and yet on the other hand, he doesn't want to turn from his sin as the prophet of the Lord wanted. Now he just evades the issue. He puts him in jail so that he can't cause any more trouble. And this is how some people respond to the prick of the conscience. Uh, not everybody responds to the prick of the conscience in an overtly angry way. Now what many people do is they simply evade the issue. They stick it in a corner of their mind and they lock it away and hope it won't cause them any more trouble. There are many different ways that we try to evade sin. Some of us, for example, offer excuses. You know, I haven't been sleeping well, or I was under a lot of pressure, or my situation is just really, really unique. Nobody else has to ever go through the kinds of things I have to go through. Or it was really out of my character. That wasn't really me. It was sort of this sub-me, whoever that is. And so we rationalise away our sin so that we don't actually need to deal with it. Others of us... On the other hand, play the blame game. Well, if she hadn't, da, 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 then I wouldn't have had to, whatever. Or if God hadn't let me, or if God had let me get into my uni course as I really, really wanted, then I wouldn't have had to be in this situation in the first place, whatever it is. The idea is it was somebody else's fault. I don't have to deal with it because it was somebody else's fault. We, we blame. Or perhaps what we might do is escape. Uh, we, we might escape into our job. Or we escape into entertainment. Or we escape into alcohol. Or we even escape into good works. Some people escape into good works to escape their past. But we find these other things that distract us and, and occupy our minds or our emotions so that we don't have to deal with the thing that is perplexing us, our conscience. This is the evasion technique. This is how some disregard their conscience. And so what about you? Does any of this connect with you? How do you deal with things when you know you've done something wrong? Uh, do you get angry about it if anyone tries to talk with you about it? Do you try to just evade the issue by one escape or another? How do you respond when you know you've done something wrong? Do not disregard your conscience. Secondly, listen to God's voice above every other voice. Always in our lives, our goal must be to listen to God before listening to anyone else. And this passage very much, and this very much is the case when it comes to dealing with our conscience. John the Baptist, in our passage, was the messenger of God. He was the messenger of God, and he came to Herod with the word of God. He told him in verse 18, "It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife." He was referring back to the law of God, which is found in God's word. And that in and of itself should have been enough. Uh, where our actions do not match up to God's word, um, we need to do what we can to set that right. Uh, and, and that will be part of the process uh, by which our troubled conscience will be relieved. Herod needed to listen to God's voice. However, Herod was not willing to do that. Instead, Herod was easily influenced by others. This is why in verse 17, we read that Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. 
his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Why did he do this? He did this for the sake of Herodias. He did it because of the influence of another. We get that same kind of thing over in verse 26. But there Herod has made this foolish vow. He's had a party at his place for his birthday. He's probably a little bit tipsy. Herodias' daughter has done this lovely dance in front of him. And so he swears, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Up to half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. And so Herodias' daughter asks her mum, what shall I ask for? And she says, the head of John the Baptist. And so now Herod is in this awful situation. What does he do? Um, well, this is a sticky situation, isn't it? Because he's made a vow, and, 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 and you should normally keep your vows. However, I trust that you appreciate that you should not keep a vow if that vow requires you to murder someone. I trust that you appreciate that. Uh, in such a case, what you need to do is confess your foolishness in making such a vow that binds you to sin. But that is not what Herod does. Why? Well, we are told in verse 26, it says there, And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse them. Even though Herod was all churned up about this, he was exceedingly sorry, yet he goes ahead with the execution because of those who sat with him. He doesn't want to lose face. He's influenced by others. Herod is a man who listens to the voice of others over the voice of God. And this is the wrong way of dealing with our conscience. If you and I have done something that is against God's law, or we are tempted to do something which is against God's law, we are to be ready to listen to the voice of God over and against every other voice. Sometimes you and I don't deal with our sin because we are influenced by others. We look around at society and we think, well, everybody else does that, so it just can't be that bad. Or it might seem to us that if we actually did deal with this sin in our life, we would seem odd to others, and so we don't want to deal with it. I once spoke to a fellow who was living with his girlfriend. Um, he said that he wanted to follow God and was very clear. It was very clear that he had a conscience about living with his girlfriend. Um, he knew that this is not what God wanted him to be doing. However, when I asked him, um, you know, had he considered getting married, he responded, oh, well, um, I haven't married her. Um, Everybody at work just lives together and it would just seem really, really weird if we got married. He was influenced by the voice of others more than by the voice of God. The Apostle Paul in Acts 23 makes this, uh, makes this claim. He said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. If you want a good conscience, you need to start living before God, first and foremost in your, in your life. You need to start living before Him. You think of Him first and foremost. His views become your number one concern over and above the, the, the views of any other person. And so when you see that, yes, according to his voice, you have sinned, that you are ready to address that. You are ready to address that even if his voice stands against the voice of many others who might not otherwise approve. If you want a good conscience, you need to be ready to listen to God's voice above every other. And then also you need to repent. This is part of... Uh, listening to God's voice. When we listen to God's voice, as I say, we'll be ready to address those areas in our lives which don't match up with his word. Back in uh, verse 12, in the passage we looked at um, last week, we saw that the disciples of Jesus went out and preached that people should repent. 
And John the Baptist, of course, himself had preached that same message in chapter 1 and verse 4, which we read earlier. It, we are told that John came baptizing in the wilderness and pe preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John, like Jesus and like his disciples, preached repentance. And so Herod, no doubt, had heard this call to repent. I mean, he, he, he liked John in many ways. He used to listen to John. He had heard this call to repent. What does it mean to repent? Well, the word repent in the original um, means to have a change of mind. That's what it means. Uh, God wants us to have a change of mind. It means you, 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 you turn from your sin and you change your mind and you turn to Him. And this is part of dealing with an uneasy conscience. Part of dealing with an uneasy conscience is that you at least put right what you are able to put right. You turn from your sin. Herod, though, was unwilling to do this. In verse 26, we are told that Herod was exceedingly sorry about John the Baptist being put to death. He was exceedingly sorry. Exceedingly sorry. Now, it's the same word that is used of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as to how Jesus was feeling. He was exceedingly sorry. But that sorrow did not actually cause him to, to turn from his action. It didn't cause him to change his mind and say, look, I did the wrong thing in making a vow that would open me up to killing someone, and I'm sorry that I made that vow. What else can I do for you? Now, even though he was sorry, he went ahead and he did it anyway. Indeed, when we look at Herod's actions later on, one of the things that we notice is that John the Baptist will not be the last man that Herod sends to an unjust death. Because in Luke chapter 23, this is the very Herod that will be one of a series of governing authorities who will try Jesus and who cannot condemn him, but who do nothing to prevent his execution. Herod might be sorrowful, but his sorrow does not lead him to change. Sometimes people think that repentance is simply being sorry. It's not. You can be sorry for something that you have done but still not turn from what you've done. Repentance is more than just a feeling. It's more than just remorse. Sometimes we can feel sad about something that we've done because just because it's gotten us into trouble. Or we can feel sad because it has given us this really guilty conscience. Um, but if we're not willing to actually try to put things right to the extent that we're able to, if we're not willing to try to do things differently in the future, that is not repentance. But we simply have not repented. If you are to deal with your conscience, you need to try to put things right to the extent that you're able to. Confess your sin. Confess to the person that you have offended and especially to the Lord who is the number one person that you've offended. Take whatever steps you can to try to fix things up, and then, by the grace of God, endeavour to turn away from that sin in the future. Try to put things right with the Lord and whoever else you've offended to the extent that you are able to. As I say, repentance is it's more than just emotional reaction. Try to put things right to the extent that you are able to. That is both the right thing to do, and you will find that as you do that, it will do an awful lot for easing your conscience. But let me say that that in and of itself will not be enough. Because even if you do everything you possibly can to put things right, it is true that our actions often do continue to have negative consequences into the future. And 
The reality is that we still did what we did, even if we tried to make things right as best as we can. We can't turn back the clock and not do it. And so putting things right is helpful, but it still only takes us so far. We still did what we did. What then is the ultimate solution? Is there an ultimate solution to this problem of an uneasy conscience? Yes, there is. There really is. There really is an ultimate solution to this problem of an uneasy conscience. And the great solution I want to say to you is Christ. And sadly, once again, this is something that Herod <coughs> missed. Herod had the opportunity to know Christ. You might remember that Christ was another one of the great themes of John's preaching. Indeed, it was the central theme of John's preaching. And so in chapter 1 and verse 7, we read that John preached saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and to loose. John's central purpose of his ministry was to point to this coming one. In another one of the Gospels, we are told about a time when John and Jesus met. And John's response there is, is, is awesome. It, it says in John 1, 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one that John preached about. And so it is something of a surprise when we get to Mark chapter 6 and interact with Herod to discover that he does not perceive who Jesus is when he hears reports of him. I mean, we know from verse 20 that Herod certainly used to listen to John's preaching. And yet, when Herod hears of a great man who is on the scene in Galilee, one who does wonders and is a prophet and so on and so on and so on. Herod cannot put the pieces together and work out that this is the one to whom John was pointing. In verse 15, we are told um, who different people thought Jesus is. Some said it is Elijah. Others said it is the prophet or one of the prophets. And of course, Herod thinks that he is John the Baptist risen from the dead. And it's interesting, in Mark chapter 8, you get a similar list. There in Mark 8, in verse 27, Jesus puts the question to his disciples. And he says, who do men say that I am? And so they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And so he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers and he says to him, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Saviour King that's been prophesied from hundreds and hundreds of years previously. You see, Peter worked it out. He worked it out. But Herod, Herod, he just couldn't see. So as I say, this is so sad. It's so sad because Christ the Saviour was the one person who could have helped Herod. Later on, as I've mentioned, Herod would let another man go unjustly, condemned to his execution. This was Jesus. And on that cross, Jesus would suffer and die. He would die an innocent man. He died an innocent man for the sake of those who were not Innocent, He died, as John said, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If only Herod could have perceived that. If only he would have listened to John and embraced the Saviour through faith. Then, in fact, he would have known what it is to have a cleansed conscience. For in Christ, there is payment for our wrongdoing, and that payment is completely sufficient to cover all our sins. Yes, even the greatest of sins, Christ pays for these on the cross. On the cross, Jesus pays what we ought to have paid. He, he does the jail time so that we go free. 
So everyone who has their trust in Jesus can know that they are no longer guilty of sin. They have been acquitted in full. If you trust in Christ, you stand in the courtroom of God as one who is not guilty. You are not guilty. That is the verdict that comes down from the judge. Why? Because your guilt has been placed on another. And he has paid the punishment in full. Not guilty. If you trust in Christ, he bears your guilt. Not you. And so you do not have to evade your conscience. You do not have to distract yourself with busyness or with excuses or with, or, or, or with some other thing. No, um, you can face your sin. You can confess your sin and seek to do whatever you are able to do to uh, put things right. And then you can rest secure in the knowledge that you are no longer counted as guilty for your sin. It's been totally, 100% dealt with at the cross. You can have your conscience cleansed. The book of Hebrews puts this explicitly. It talks about the various cleansing ceremonies that were part of Jewish ritual. And that says, if those cleansing ceremonies seemed like they cleansed, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself Without spot to God, cleanse your conscience. What he's saying is that the blood of Christ cleanses your conscience. It cleanses your conscience because you know that the matter has been totally dealt with. It has been dealt with at the cross. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. If only Herod had listened to John. If only he had perceived and embraced the very one of whom he was hearing the chorus. There is a solution to an uneasy conscience, and it is to be found in Christ. And so if you want to know what it is to have a cleansed conscience, let me conclude by urging you to turn to Christ. Yes, you do need to do whatever you can to put things right. But in the end, none of that can actually remove your guilt. It can't change what you did. Only Christ can remove your guilt. You need to turn to Christ. Confess your sin to him and ask him to take your guilt upon yourself, upon himself, and he will do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of a cleansed conscience. We thank you for the work of Christ. We thank you for one who makes atonement for sin, uh, one who takes our guilt on himself and who... uh, Uh, deals with it completely on the cross. We praise you for that and we pray that you would help each one of us to turn to him and to know what it is to have a cleansed conscience because of what he has done in our place. We pray this in Jesus' name.